what bad things happen? What's the list? Well, what's the list? You want me to bad mouth what happened before? Well, I, I mean, I, I think, I think, I think what happened, problems. I think one of the things that happened, let me give you, okay, let me give you an example. You're in analysis with someone and they're analyzing your Oedipus complex and they forgot to, to talk about with you about your feelings about the fact that you lost 35 relatives in the Holocaust. Okay. Nothing about that is said. You may bring it up, but the therapist won't pick up on it. Okay. That is not good. And often what would happen is the obvious would never be addressed. How does it feel talking to me? a white male uh, with probably all kinds of unconscious biases. What does that mean? What do we do with that? That was not so frequent in previous generations of psychoanalysts. It just wasn't because it was just understood to be we analyze the mind and the external realities are just not as important. By the way, other things were going on outside of North America and outside of Freudian circles and outside of the UK in Europe, in South America, but we didn't have conversations with them back then. We have them now, but they were doing interesting creative work that certainly hinted at the relational approaches. But back in the US from about 1940 to 1990 or so, it was ego psychology that dominated. So you couldn't talk about the fact that you cried in the session with your patient about some sexual abuse that happened in the patient's life. Uh, or the patient's grandmother and how that impacted her. It didn't work with people. It, it didn't work with men and it didn't, well, I can't say it didn't work. It, I mean, a lot of people got this really a lot of help. What? People got a lot of help, but it wasn't sufficient and it may have been artificial at times because people who were analyzed for the Oedipus complex brilliantly still went on to have miserable relationships and suffered. It's not like some internal neurosis that's been operating on them. Now that's not to say that they are not internal neurosis. It's just that this and this. Mm -hmm. I once tried to draw a diagram of all the influences on relational psychoanalysis and then I really gave up. I just had one simplistic diagram. It's either a simplistic diagram or something that looked like something out of complexity theory. Yeah. Remember, the relational world is a large tent interpersonal, British object relations, self-psychological, uh, feminism, constructivism, attachment theory, uh, some contemporary trends in Freudian thinking, and you know, and then, but the circles get more complex as I think about it. Then we've got, you know, infant and attachment, infant research, then I got existential uh, philosophy in that, and then I have the analyst's individual personality, and you, you get the drift. Play with them. Knock yourself out. Let the, me the, use a dichotomy. Okay? And the dichotomy is that it's either we have a beast animal or we have a social animal. And the social animal was acknowledged very late. The infant is born social right away. The mechanisms, and probably has to do with survival and Darwinian stuff, and that from day one we start building relationships. From day one and that relationships is where the action is. So I have a relationship with my family, I have a relationship with my professional community, I have a relationship with the, my heroes, I have a relationship with my uh, family in Greece, I have a relationship with my uh, uh, local uh, uh, congresswoman. So all those relationships would have to be taken into account to fully understand how I'm suffering on an issue. My attitude, when, when, I, when I teach and I say I'm going to present the case now, and if there are 50 people in the room, my understanding is that there will be 50 different ways of handling the case. Because each of the people in the audience is a different personality, and that will bring out different things in a, in a patient. That, that's the mutual influence that's going on. It, it can be very helpful to find out how the, the patient is experiencing your influence or your background mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, I'm a man, you're a woman, what are we doing talking about this? Or I'm trans and you're straight as a patient and like, what do we do with this? You know, in other words, there are, there are elephants in the room, so to speak, and they were often not acknowledged. The power differentials between the, you know, I'm in a fancy office and I got like antique, antique, 
Greek pottery in the corner of my office. How is the door opened? You know, how, you know, do you have a doorman in your office building with white gloves? I mean, what is that going to say to a poor uh, patient, you know, who's coming from a lower socioeconomic background? Right. You know, and, and that's got to have an influence. There's a racial difference in here, and what's the impact that it has? Of course, black psychoanalysts today, in 2022, are doing phenomenal work, and we're benefiting from it. Phenomenal work in understanding that race is always an issue, and race is always in the room. Whether you know you're, you know, a white Protestant with a, an Asian American or a, or an African American, and that for uh, for so many of us, uh, our our histories, uh, slavery, uh, the what happens to indigenous people. Uh, I can give you an. I, I can't get into the details, but a person is having an extraordinarily large bar mitzvah. Uh, for her son, and she's invited everybody on the planet, and she's trying to figure out what is she, what is she, what has she done with this? Because it may not, her kid just wants other kids at the moment. And we come to understand that what she's saying is, the people that I lost in the Holocaust are still with me and they're represented by the people that I, I have a community, I have an important tribe today, and that the, the Nazi death machine didn't win. Okay? And that this is her way of saying, I'm alive and I thrive and the generations weren't demolished completely. Okay? That's something that a relational analyst will be all over on. You know, it's common. Uh, uh, it's a common understanding that the relational uh, 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 kickoff in psychoanalysis was the 1983 book by Jay Greenberg and Steve Mitchell, which is a big and powerful uh, book, but and has had and continues to have a lot of influence uh, on the field. Uh, but there was a before that beginning. It was Ferenczi and Runk, I think in 1925, who wrote a book titled The Development of Psychoanalysis. They spoke in that book about the experience uh, in the clinical room. Ferenczi went on to really uh, uh, work on trauma and to really understand um, what he labeled, uh, what was labeled mutual analysis. This is things that he called um, relaxation techniques and so forth. The Anna Freudians are pushing ego psychology and they're pushing the idea of defense analysis and the working alliance and having a relationship with the patient. The Kleinian uh, part of the British object relations are talking about all kinds of things that are going on between mother and child, greed and envy and the messiness of what goes on between people early on. Contemporary psychoanalysis is pluralistic, it's multiple, okay? And some, for example, strains of self-psychology are, are not pluralistic. Uh, some ego-psychology or some Jungian psychologies are not pluralistic. So I think trying to integrate that, which is a headache, by the way, it's not easy to integrate it. Uh, and I think uh, the idea of, of the triangle, as uh, I think articulated, as presented by Mitchell in his 88 book on relational concepts, if you, if you imagine a triangle with a self pole, an other pole, and the third pole being an interaction pole, the self pole of the triangle would be, imagine on that self pole, hovering around that self pole would be Winnicott and Cohut. Okay. Cohut would be interested in narcissism, would be interested in the self, would be interested in mirroring the patient. Okay. Winnicott would be interested in holding the patient. Okay. On the other pole, you have somebody like Fairburn, or you have somebody like Eric Fromm, Fairburn, who spoke about uh, trauma and the relationship to others. And Fromm from the interpersonal school, uh, he used to, Fromm loved to talk about how conforming to, to the current culture was really crazy. Are you a Marxist? Are you a conformist? You know, because the culture was crazy and you conform to it, you adapt to it, that's not good. No wonder you're going to feel highly anxious or depressed. And then on that third pole, you have interaction, which is where you could hover, where you could place people like Sullivan and Bowlby. Okay. 
Sullivan was pre very preoccupied with the intimate details that actually go, that go on between people. But how do things look behaviorally between you and me uh, as we're talking? And Bowlby was interested in, in attachment. Do we act anxiously? Do we act disorganized in relation to other people? So different relational analysis gravitate towards one end of the pole over the other. No one is perfectly at the center of the triangle. That, what's inside the triangle would be a relational approach which sees all of those things operating. As a matter of fact, the relational, one of the relational principles is that every diet has to invent its own psychoanalysis. Every diet is unique. You're not applying some mechanical technique. That's very important to a relationalist. It's very hard because the theory kind of gives us a roadmap and we kind of, part of us wants the roadmap. And I think, I think it, it takes some uh, alertness and some, um, uh, uh, a, a kind of integrity to not confuse the map for the actual terrain.